Uh, my name is Alva Trustee. I'm at the University of Finley. All of my critical information is up there on this slide. It's also right at the top of the Google Doc. Uh, at the University of Finley, the icon on the campus is the arch in Old Main. Our building, Old Main, was the first academic building in the country to be heated by natural gas. Finley was big in the gas boom in the late 1800s. Uh, if you've ever heard of a company called Marathon, it's in Finley. Uh, and we have the oldest ongoing graduation ceremony where our students actually march through this arch. So I tend to take a lot of pictures of the arch. By the way, all the photos I'm showing you are, are photos I've taken. If, I, if somebody else took the photo, it'll be obvious, or I'll give you the Flickr link to it to, to see where I found it. But uh, I have fall, winter, collages, all kinds of uh, pictures of the arch. So I'm trying to give you guys this visual of what the university looks like. Everybody got it? Uh, okay, first test. Close your eyes and imagine someone coloring with crayons. Everybody got that image in your brain? If you've looked at the notes, I've polluted your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Me, okay, here, first question. How many people imagined a little girl? How many people imagined a little boy? How many people imagined Buzz? <laughs> Only the peanut gallery gets that, right? Okay. Here's the clincher. How many people imagined a clip art child? Did anyone? No one. This is why we never let our kids use clip art, period. Raise your hand if you have at least one camera on you right now. Pretty much, how many people have two, three? Ten. <laughs> my, uh, my hands young, okay. Yet, we let our kids uh, use clip art for all kinds of things. In fact, if you look at Facebook, I just read last week with their IPO going out, Facebook has 3,000 pictures uploaded every second. That's 95 billion a year. And they're all lousy pictures that kids are taking of each other making goofy faces. <laughs> Almost all of them are. Uh, I have a link in the notes to an article uh, that someone's written about how we don't let our kids use creativity when we let them use clip art. Now I'm going to talk a lot about visual literacy. Before I do that, I want to talk about literacy. So what is literacy? It's the ability to read words and understand words. It's the ability to write and write something that someone else can understand. That is, in a nutshell, and I don't have a degree in literacy, but I asked someone with a PhD in literacy, and, and they said, yeah, that's good enough. So what is visual literacy? Visual literacy is the same thing, except you take out the words and you put in images. A person who's visually literate can look at a photograph and understand the idea that was conveyed, the, the purpose of the photograph, what the person who made the photograph was trying to convey. They can also make a photograph or an image that someone else could understand this is the idea that I'm trying to convey. Uh, an example would be this picture that I took with this camera. I wanted uh, something that said literacy, so I opened up uh, a book, took a picture of the book, and in essence conveyed to you what I think literacy is in picture form. Now there's a big difference between what pure text can do and what can happen with the photograph. First off, text is stored in your brain in short-term memory. We have seven-digit phone numbers because we can remember about seven bits of information if it's text. But if we can see a picture, not only can we process it, you've heard this many times, I'm sure, I've got a link to the research that shows from 3M that it's 60,000 times faster to process than text but it also goes directly in to long-term memory. Take a picture, it will last longer. It wasn't just something I thought of as a clever title. It really does last longer because it goes into your uh, long-term memory, which is why I picked this visual literacy picture to begin with. So let's do the first part. Let's look at some photographs and just think about 
do you know what this photograph is trying to say? I'll go all the way back to when photography was very new to the Civil War. Anyone recognize this photo? The, the Devil's Den. That's exactly right. This is at Gettysburg. This was taken by uh, Matthew Brady, a very famous, probably the most famous Civil War uh, photographer, at Devil's Den. And this is, uh, I think it's called the Sharpshooter at Devil's Den or something. I remember seeing this picture when I was, I don't know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, whenever you study U.S. history for the first time. I remember seeing this photograph in class. And when I ran across this looking for all the photos, I was amazed that I still remembered it. Everyone recognizes this? And you associate this picture with what era? The Depression. This is the migrant worker, migrant woman, migrant mother. Uh, depending on who you look at, they have different names for this particular picture. Uh, this is the most published photograph of all time. And where, where did this take place? Iwo Jima. Again, if you're looking at the notes, it's kind of unfair, right? One of the things I want you to realize is each one of these photos probably has some sort of emotional attached to it. You're thinking, you know, the thrill of victory, you know, we captured this hill, uh, back to the Depression, back to the tragedy of the Civil War. Finally, victory over Japan Day, a very famous photo. Uh, that's when this one happened. Uh, when do you think this photograph was taken? Most of you probably know the date because this is just uh, probably within an hour of when JFK was assassinated. How about this photograph? This is the first Earth rise photographed by, I think, Apollo 8. I, I, I shouldn't say that without knowing for sure, but I know it was the first people that orbited the moon, and when they came up from the back side of the moon, they took this photograph. This is the most uh, copied photograph from NASA. And who took the photograph? <coughs> Neil Armstrong, because the picture is of Buzz Aldrin. Anyone recognize this one? <laughs> 1980, USA over Russia, Olympikaki. How about this one? Aftermath of 9-11. And then since I started with the Civil War, I thought it appropriate to talk about the inauguration of the first African-American president. So all of these things, even though these were photos, deal with visual literacy. There's other things, like, uh, say, symbols on a map. Uh, there's a lot of visual literacy that you could use to figure out exactly where you are on that map. Or if you're looking at uh, charts. Also, if you have any device that has icons, that would be the dashboard of your car, a smartphone, a computer, an iPad, anything. There's a certain amount of visual literacy you have to have in order to understand all of the different components of that. I know it's normal that I show a little Seinfeld clip, but I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of pushed for time. So I just did a couple screen captures, and I did it to talk about not only understanding what visual literacy is, but to understand if I make a photo, what is inappropriate? <laughs> and there's an episode of Seinfeld where Kramer takes a few racy pictures of George, you know, what was it, the timeless art of seduction or something like that. <laughs> and, and they ended up getting in trouble and all this kind of stuff. These are photos that someone else has made that all of us hopefully can relate to. What about making a photo? Uh, my junior high daughter has started to ice skate. She's off at the ice skating rink, and I sent her a text message, and I said, how many people are ice skating tonight? Now, she could have texted me back and said, oh, 50, 75. Instead, I got this, this many. So she made a picture with her cell phone, sent it to me, and it shows me that there's, I don't know, 50, 75 kids or so. Now, she has the phone that if you drop in the toilet, it's no big deal. We just go get another one. So this has a 320 by 240 resolution camera, but still, I could recognize that photo. Most people who know me, know my family, don't know that my wife has a degree in medical illustration. She's a really good artist. This is one of her drawings from when she was an undergrad. This is an example, a couple of things actually, how we should be able to draw something so that someone understands exactly what we're drawing. Even though this one is diagrammed because it has such detail, I should be able, if I'm visually literate, to play the game of Pictionary and draw things that people can, can understand what they are. Also, 
I threw this in because I'm doing this project. She has this big portfolio, and it's on paper. And someday, it's going to be yellow. So this year, every week, I photograph one of these pictures, and I put them online just as a project. Here's, so far, this is the family favorite from her collection. Now, you don't have to have a medical illustration degree in order to draw pictures so that people can understand what you're, you're drawing. You could be, let's say, someone who trains people to be superintendents of schools. You could do drawings. This one I actually photographed with my camera, put it into PowerPoint uh, for Buzz. Buzz does all these elaborate drawings, and then we put them into PowerPoint. You can also take pictures that try to capture emotion. What emotion would you say this is? Pro probably excited, unless you're that little girl right in the front. Then it's, hey, this is way too loud. <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> this is, I'm a cute little girl, but I'm trying to look scary. <laughs> now, uh, my wife and I volunteer to take pictures of pretty much anything on campus. So uh, at the Mazza Museum, which if you, I think I have a link to the Mazza in the notes, they have these events there all the time with kids, and they do all kinds of fun things. And we go take pictures, and then we put them out on Flickr uh, so that anybody can uh, get pictures of their kids. This little girl comes up to my wife, and she says, I'm a tiger. Take a picture of me. I'm really scary. So my wife takes this picture, and immediately the little girl says, let me see it. I want to see that I was scary enough. If our assessments with everything else were as good as our assessments with photography, we'd be incredible. All, anyone could be a teacher. I can look at a picture, say, oh, cut your head off. Let me take another one. Oh, too bright, too dark, out of focus. I immediately know from assessing a photo on the back of my point and shoot camera whether or not I've done the project correctly. I take these presentations here seriously, and I thought the only way I could really do this talk is if I, if I had the right camera. So I searched high and low because it was going to have to be a unique camera. I was looking for a G1. Now, if you know things about cameras, the lower the number, the better. This is as good as they get. This is an $1,100 point and shoot camera if you go back to the year 2000. Now, if you wait 12 years, you go out on eBay, you can get one of these for about 75 bucks. So I got one for 75 bucks. With one of these, I can send it to school. If my daughter drops it, it wasn't 1,000 bucks. It was 75 bucks. And by the way, 12 years ago, they made them to where you could drop them, and there wasn't a whole lot to break. It's got one of these oh. one, one inch diagonally uh, video screens on it. But it takes great pictures. In fact, you saw this picture. I took that picture with that camera. I took a lot of pictures with that camera to show you in the same way that a stove makes you a great cook, a great camera makes you a great photographer. And you've probably heard that has been said by many people, and it's very true. I know people with iPhones that take incredible photographs, but if I gave them a $5,000 camera, they'd still take great photographs. Now, before we talk about much more visual literacy, what I wanted to do in this talk is tell you everything I wish someone had told me when I got my first camera. Because I took a lot of bad pictures before I finally figured out this is how I take a good picture every single time. And we're going to start off talking about light. Because without light, wait, this isn't a sermon. <laughs> when you're doing photography, light is probably the most important thing because in the darkness, it is almost impossible, and I say almost impossible because nowadays you can actually take pretty good pictures in the dark, but it's a whole lot easier if you understand light and the settings on your camera that control that light. And the three important factors on your camera are shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Most cameras have this, even if you don't have a little dial on the camera that says this. Let me explain each one. The first one is shutter speed. This is the only a photography term I knew when I bought a camera. And shutter speed is pretty easy. How long is the shutter open while I take a picture? The longer it's open, the more light gets in. So if I wanted to say, take a picture at the state track meet during the fastest race at the meet, which is the 100 meter dash, 
I don't want the shutter open very long at all because I don't want everything to be blurry. I want it to stop the motion. The guy in the green from Tenora there last year was the fastest guy in the state, one of the hundred. And if you look closely, it's not blurry at all. That's because that shutter was only open for one twenty-five hundredth of a second, a very short time. But I had to have a lot of light to make that happen. I'll talk about that. Uh, last year at Educon, I was at a reception where it was almost dark. By the way, I haven't used a flash on a, on a camera probably in a year and a half. So I don't, in fact, my good camera doesn't even have a flash on it. So I saw uh, Will Richardson and Gary Steger. And I said, Will, can you get, can you get uh, Gary in a headlock? Because these two kind of have a history, even though now they're friends. And I thought, uh, even with this blurry picture, maybe I could come up with a really neat uh, poster someday about these two guys. So very low light. I had to keep the shutter open a long time, so it was really blurry. But I got a picture that I could use. The next thing, and this is, I, I wish someone would have explained to me what aperture is. I remember the first camera that I used actually had a ring on it that you could turn. Here you can see on this lens, this is one of my lenses that actually has a ring that you could turn. This one is set to, it says 2.8, and it turns all the way up to 22. Well, here's what that means. The aperture is how big the hole is in the lens. The bigger the hole, the more light gets in. That seems obvious, right? But it turns out by the time you get to 2.8, it's classified as a low light lens. So if you're buying a lens, ask them if it's faster than 2.8. That's kind of the level where anything bigger than 2.8 is considered a fast lens. And if I change that number from 2.8 to 4 to 5.6, notice that hole, as that number gets, goes up, that hole gets smaller and smaller until I get uh, to the limit on this lens, which was F22. Notice it's F over 22, so it's a res there's a lot of math in photography, which is another great thing, especially if you teach math. So when I get down to 22, very, very small hole, which means it doesn't let in very much light. So if I'm taking a picture at a track meet and there's a ton of bright light, I can close down that aperture and then I can take a picture without everything looking just completely white. Now what I didn't know was how this affected my photograph. This is the fastest, the fastest lens that I own is a 1.4. Now this one costs 300, 350 bucks, but you can buy a 1.8, which is very fast, for 99 bucks. And you can get it for Canon or Nikon. And in fact, when people say, what lens should I buy? I always say, buy a 50 millimeter or 1.8. This is a little bit wider, a 1.4. Notice I focused right on the end of this ruler. And at this point, you might not even be able to tell that that's a ruler. But as I, I, I left everything else for the camera, and I slowly changed it, and I closed down the aperture. And what do you notice? There's 8, there's 11, they'll hop all the loops. Did anyone see that piece of lint on the table? when we were out here at f1.4. Uh, when I close down the aperture, it makes it to where I have less depth of field. More depth of field, I'm sorry. I'm dyslexic, forgive me. If I have a really big hole, it means that my focus range is very narrow. If I have a tiny little hole, it means I can focus a long way. So let's say you wear glasses and something happens, you're camping and you lose your glasses and you can't see, that old Boy Scout trick. Take a leaf, poke a tiny little hole in the leaf, hold it up to your eye. That's smaller than F22. A, a tiny hole poked in the leaf and things will be in focus for you. So if I take this lens and I open it up wide open, notice how the background looks. It's all out of focus. It looks really kind of neat. These are pictures that I've taken. Uh, I'll talk more about my Stranger Project later where the background, it just kind of looks neat because the background is out of focus. Something else you can do is, it's called tilt shift. This is a lens baby, and the lens is on a, like a ball and socket. 
You can buy one of these. I think the cheapest ones are about 99 bucks. You can do some really cool things with these because you can shift the axis of the photograph. Another neat thing you can do is you can pop in these apertures. And I ordered a couple blanks so I could cut them out any shape that I wanted. If I take a picture, let's say using the star aperture, I just pop that in. Any light that's out of focus becomes the shape of the aperture. And since it's Valentine's Day, here's one with the uh, heart aperture in there. You can see all of the out of focus light. Even though the flower's in focus, the out of focus things have the heart shape. The, the last thing left here is ISO. And if you can remember film, you can probably remember there was a rating on the film. It was thousand speed film. Do you remember that? I always remember. Oh, make sure you get thousand feet speed film. That is the ISO rating. That's how sensitive the film is to light. The bigger that number, the more sensitive it is to light. Here's what I did. I went into a classroom, took my camera, set it on a tripod. All other things the same, I changed the ISO. This is 100. Notice as I go up, each of my pictures gets brighter and brighter and brighter. So here's 3200. This particular camera goes to 6400. All I changed was the ISO. So if I don't have a lot of light, I can crank that up. And I'll talk about the, that I could get more light in my, my photographs. Let's talk about what it takes to get twice as much light. Because every one of these things is related in increments of two. If I go down this list of apertures from 22 to 16, I double the amount of light. If I go down at the bottom, if I go from 2.0 to 1.4, I'm getting twice, the hole is big enough that twice as much light can go in. If I compare that to shutter speed, that's a little easier. You know, if it's open for one second, that's twice as much light as half a second. So as I go down this, I get more light each, each one of these speeds. Likewise, in ISOs, every time I double my ISO, I get twice as much light. So let's say that I have a standard camera. It does aperture 5.6, a 60th of a second, ISO 800. And I, I want less blur, so I'm going to crank up the shutter speed to 125. To get the exact same picture, all I have to do is take the aperture down a notch to 4 and get the same amount of light. So as I take one up, if I want the same amount of light, I have to take one of those other things in another direction. To prove that, I put my camera on a tripod again, and I put f, f stop at 4. And then I change the other two things. So notice this is ISO 100, 160th of a second. If I go twice as sensitive to ISO 200, but half the shutter speed, I get essentially the same photograph. In fact, I repeated this over and over. And every time I got what looked to be the exact same photograph until I limited my camera. My camera would only go 1 4,000th of a second. So when I went from 3,200 to 6,400, it got a lot lighter because I couldn't go to an 8,000th of a second. It's still, uh, my shutter was still going really fast, but the, the film was more sensitive. The question is, why not just crank the ISO up to 6400 and take all your pictures that way? Well, remember, if you went back and looked at the, the film slide, the higher the ISO, the more grainy the photograph. And it might be so grainy that it's unacceptable. Now, the thing is, today's cameras, this is ISO 100. This is ISO 3200. From your end, can you see that much difference? Ryan, could you see a difference? Yeah. yeah but how significant? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. That's right. So last night I did an experiment, kind of two projects in one. I cranked my camera up to 6,400. That's uh, this camera. This is about a $600 camera, so it's not a whole lot of money. This is uh, a consumer grade. It's a Canon uh, Rebel camera. Uh, I cranked it up to 6,400, and I went to the tweet up which was at the cantina where there wasn't a whole lot of light. And I took this picture at 6,400. Now, would that be an OK picture if I wanted to update my Facebook uh, profile picture? It looks OK to me. Now, if you look closely, you'll see it's a lot grainier than at 100 ISO. But the thing is, I was in a, very, a room that was much darker than this. And I took a photograph that looks fine. 
Uh, by the way, this is Laura. Is she here? She's here. She is my 36th stranger. I'm doing a project where I approach a person, I introduce myself, I say, I'm taking pictures of strangers. Can I take your picture? Now, I can't do a candid shot. I can't see you across the way and take your picture. I have to go up to you, introduce myself, take a picture. And like I said, I'm doing 100 of them. If you go to 100 Strangers, you can uh, read about the project. It's a, ni it's a nice little project. Yes? Um, I'm at school very often. There's plays going on. And I have to sit with my class. I've got a special ed class, so I can't just write up there. Does this also work? Or you well, sure to work. And as long as the ISO's down. Yeah, in fact, what, you'd want to pay attention to this little sequence of slides. Usually your camera does what's called a evaluative meter. That means the, the sensor looks at the whole picture and figures out how much light there is. If I look at this whole scene and figure out how much light there is, and it happens there's a lot of dark spots, like say I'm, I'm taking pictures of things on a stage. What do you notice about the girl playing the flute? It's all washed out. That's because the whole scene has a lot of black in it. And the little girl's face doesn't have a whole lot of black. But it turns out you can tell your camera to do spot metering. And that little circle in the center is the only part of the picture that it looks at to see if you have enough light. So with spot metering, I point it right to the face of the person that I want to photograph. And I take here the same picture. Right? It's actually, it's a different concert. But now I use spot metering, and everybody looks in focus, even though there's even more black in this particular background. Uh, this is probably an obje object that all of you would recognize. Evaluative metering, I switched to spot metering and took this photograph. All I did was point right at the moon. It figured out how much light that was. It adjusted the exposure. Worked fine. Let's talk a little bit about resolution. Everybody thinks I need a camera that has, you know, 52 megapixels or something crazy. The camera that I showed you cost 75 bucks is a 3.3 megapixel camera. It's about that big. I drew a little box in there. My uh, cell phone is an 8 megapixel camera. This is my cell phone. My uh, point and shoot camera and my old SLR are 10 megapixel cameras. Now it's quite a jump when I go from 10 to 18. This camera is 18 megapixels. Like I said, this is a consumer grade camera. It's, a, it's the latest uh, Canon Rebel, it's a T3i, but you can buy one of these for 650 bucks. I just got it for Christmas, so I know. And then my professional grade camera, this one is 21 megapixels. You could buy four T3i's with what this guy costs. So these, if you're serious about photography, buy one of these. Otherwise, buy the consumer grade. Get a good point and shoot. Now, the critical thing you have to realize is this little black square up in the top left corner is 1024 by 768. That is the resolution of the projector that's projecting this picture. So on this screen, you will not be able to see a picture bigger than that little teeny black rectangle. And in fact, I went over our whole university and I could not find one projector that was more than 1024 by 768. So that means even if you're using your cell phone or a $75 camera, you have pixels to throw away, which is a good thing. One other thing, the ratio of this screen is three to four, three to four. Most point and shoot cameras are the same ratio, four to three. If you have an SLR, it is probably three to two, which means your photograph is gonna hang over the edges a little bit. Or as you'll notice on some of my photographs, there's a black bar at the bottom because it wasn't the exact same ratio. So when you're taking a picture, make sure if you know you're gonna project this in your class, adjust it so that, that it fits properly. Um, I use the G1 and I took pictures of each one of the cameras that I've just showed you, a 10 megapixel, an 18 megapixel, and a 21 megapixel camera. And you may say, why would you not buy a car and instead <laughs> buy a camera like this? Which is really the decision I had to make. Do I want to drive my car for five more years or do I want to buy a camera? And I point back to the picture of 
the state track meet. If you look closely, a little box that's about 1024 by 768, this is a 21 megapixel picture. If I zoom in on this guy's arm, Ryan, can you read that? Can you read the music? In Christ alone my hope is found. So I can actually read a 100 yard dash runner's tattoo on his arm. Of course, I could see the whole picture too, but that's really the benefit of having all those extra pixels. When you get a camera like that, buy eight or 10 terabytes of hard drive because you fill up the hard drives like crazy because the pictures are so stinking big. People ask me all the time, what camera do I buy? Here's the important thing. After you decide how much money you have, <laughs> buy a camera that has this dial, a dial that lets you control aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. That's pretty simple. If you can control the three parts that control the amount of light in your photograph, you can take a good picture in any circumstance outside of total darkness. Uh, even the G1 has those settings on the little dial. So you can buy, by the way, don't buy a $75 camera, spend 120 and get one that's, you know, this year's version of the consumer grade. They're all incredible cameras. Once you understand how to take the picture, that's, that's the big difference. Also, go to Digital Photography Review. I wish that every technical device had a site like this. You can look up any device and find out everything about the device on the site. I take a, a lot of pictures where I, ha I pull my point-and-shoot camera out of my pocket and I take a picture of something. Now, if the shutter speed is open for a while, say a 30th or a 15th of a second, it's going to be blurry. And uh, if I'm at a dinner and it's really dark. So what I did is I bought this tripod that I can carry in my pocket. Some of you might know it as a wrist rest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is in my pocket all the time, one pocket this, one pocket uh, my point and shoot camera, and I can take good pictures uh, just about any time. Uh, don't ask me what brand to buy. Obviously, I buy Canon. The reason I buy Canon is simple. I had a Canon film camera and I had two lenses. Talk to your family. If you have brothers, sisters, parents that have Nikon cameras, buy a Nikon camera or vice versa. When you take your pictures, it's important that the lighting be, the exposure be correct, but you also have something, you have to have something in focus. Uh, this is a, a, one of my student project's pictures, and obviously it's out of focus. How about this picture? Is this picture in focus? This is my dog. If you look at the eyes of what is photographed and the eyes are in focus, your brain will tell you that the photograph is in focus. So this looks in focus to you, even though the ears and the window behind are completely out of focus, you look at that and you identify it, you think it's in focus because the eyes are in focus. Here's something that you can do with a, a, a big aperture. Remember that uh, background is blurry. Is the girl back there happy, sad, scared? She looked excited. She was showing everybody this big scary thing. So I just positioned the picture so that you couldn't identify who the girl was, but you could see by the expression on her face that she was excited. I uh, gave my sixth grader an assignment last week. I sent her to school after I had checked with the principal that it was okay with the $75 camera. And before I sent her, I showed her this picture. I said, I would like you to take a picture just like this, but in your class. The teacher has to be blurry, the student I can only see the back of the student, it has to be in focus. And she took this picture from the back of the room with a $75 camera. This was taken with the camera that would buy a car with the $99 lens I was talking about a minute ago. Uh, I've talked about the ru rule of thirds in a lot of my other presentations. In a nutshell, here's what it is. If I take a photograph and divide it into thirds, sideways and up and down, where those lines intersect is where your eye focuses. So try to put the interesting part of your photograph in those crosshairs. If you look at photos, some of you have already seen, notice how many interesting things are at those crosshairs. 
So even though you might not realize what makes a photo look good, if you know this little rule when you're taking a photo, you can take much better photos. Here's a picture of my church I took with my point-and-shoot camera. Notice I kind of made it to where the interesting parts were in the right spot. This is from Holmes County last year. Again, an Amish man in his buggy. And this was the last cookie at the end of Christmas vacation. I called it Soul Survivor. <laughs> So whenever you're taking pictures, use the rule of thirds. Let's end up with uh, just some common things that I've seen in the classroom uh, that involve some kind of uh, visual literacy. Uh, the first day of class, I take a photo of every student in every one of my classes. First off, it helps me learn their names because I have a little sign-up sheet and they write down their names and I know the order that they were taken and so on. But I use those in all kinds of projects during the semester. I don't have a studio, but I have a classroom that has a projector screen. So I pull down the projector screen, instant studio. Also, I don't use a flash. I use my 1.4 so I can open it up. If I used a flash, there would be this black shadow that was on that projector screen behind the student. And if you'll notice your pictures, lots of times when you have a flash, especially if someone's close to a wall, you get that shadow of the person behind you. Another project I've been doing for years with my students involves geotagging. I have my students take pictures of historical markers, and then in Flickr, they tag them with Remarkable Ohio. And we're up to almost 1,000 of these over the many years that I've been doing this project in my classes. This is a a principal of a guy I met at EdgeCon. This is his school. They have 184, they're Canadian. Their school year is not 180 days, it's 184 days. They take a picture of something every day that says, this is what I learned today. And they put it on the blog, and the kids write about, this is what this picture means, which is what I learned today. Another thing I've talked about a lot is Creative Commons, something that deals with copyright. You may never have a student that writes a song or writes a book and has to deal with copyright, but every one of your students will post pictures to Facebook, and if you create a picture, you have all the copyright of a, a person who writes a story or writes a song. So Creative Commons lets them understand that enough that they can give back without creating an onerous environment for the person who wants to use that photograph. All of our pictures we put on Flickr and we, we make them Creative Commons. So anybody can use them without asking my permission. So this is a picture we took at the Mazza. Last week I went out to eat. I pick up the Finley magazine and it's the picture that's on the front cover. They didn't have to ask me, but they had to give me credit for that, which they did. Wow, I'm out to eat and I see this picture I took and you know nobody else knew that was my picture, but I saw it. Actually, this is my wife's picture. She took this one. I said, did we take that picture? Oh my gosh, yeah, that's kind of a neat thing. I showed you this picture before. This is, I think, a very representative picture of Old Main and the Arch. If you go to Wikipedia and you look, you'll see that that picture is on Wikipedia. Encyclopedia Britannica has used pictures of the Old Main of mine and put into the online version of Encyclopedia Britannica. All of them are Creative Commons. Could I have made money with those? Probably not. Do you have a student who can say, I have a picture in Encyclopedia Britannica? That's all you have to say. I've looked at a lot of different high school web pages on Wikipedia. This is the high school, the district where I live. There's no photograph of the high school on this page, and I don't understand why. All we have to do is the principal says, we want a picture on Wikipedia. Please take pictures, put them out there. The Wikipedian people will decide which one's the best, and some kid is going to have a picture on Wikipedia. I talked about the historical markers. Something else we do with that project is geotagging. This is a field trip I took with one of my kids. The, on South Main Street in Finley is where all the people who made the money during the gas boom, they built their houses. Every time I took a photo of one of those houses, I geotagged it. I recorded the latitude and longitude of that particular house. If you look through, you can go right headed south on Main Street and you can look and see where every one of these houses and it's probably accurate within 50 feet of where that house actually sits. 
We do this on all our vacations. Last fall, we went to Greenfield Village, took all of our pictures, geotagged them, so that we could say, you know, that's where we saw the windmill, that's where we rode the cars. All, very simple to do. It was a really neat project. Here's one called Five Card Flicker. Now, this isn't taking photos. This is saying, give me five photos. I'm going to write a story about those photos. Every time you go to this page, you get five different photos. So now you can have your students interpret what those pictures mean and write stories about those. And by the way, they can publish them right on the site. So you can go back and you can see some of the pictures that people saw and some of the stories that they wrote. Here's a, a game site that shows you a picture and you have to guess the tag on the picture. Uh, I certainly don't have time to talk about digital storytelling. Uh, there are sessions here that talk about digital storytelling. This is taking photographs, not movie clips, photographs and telling stories with them. Something that any third grader can do. Last fall, my wife and I took a trip to uh, Mackinac Island and we're walking around and she sees this. What's it look like? It's a gate in the shape of the letter M. So she says, we should find the letters of the alphabet. So here's my Mackinac. It's probably hard to see in the back. Here's her Mackinac. And you know, we got home, we printed out the letters of the alphabet in the shape of letters. There's all kinds of projects out there like this. There's also uh, math and geometry projects. Uh, there's a whole bunch of one Flickr. To understand how to take photographs of things useful in the classroom is I give them a PowerPoint presentation with no pictures. And they have to add pictures to all of them. So they have to understand how to take a picture of something like a pencil or a calculator. I showed you this a minute ago. Again, this one's blurry. They could look at that picture and say, it's blurry. Take it again, refocus. Here's one of one that wasn't blurry. Now you might say, I don't have a light box where I can put a device like this and take a photo that looks this professional. This is my studio. It's a piece of white paper on the table. I think I had a puzzle box in the back holding up the back of the white piece of paper. And I do this all the time. I cropped out everything except the white paper, and when I get rid of what I cropped out, it looks like a professional photo. I could uh, add my little, hey, I took this with a $75 camera. Now, for the really big stuff, I actually roll out the $4 roll of uh, wrapping paper that I got at Walmart, and I can put big stuff, and you can see I just draped it over the same table. Whenever I do something serious, I usually go into our sunroom because lots of light. All those windows, makes it, it's a whole lot easier to take a picture in bright light. You have to persuade them. I thought I'd throw this in since it was Valentine's Day. But if you talk really nice to your dog, you can get your dog to lay down on that white sheet of paper and you can take a, a Valentine's Day picture. Now realize when you deal with animals, you get about 100 of them that look like this. <laughs> but eventually you do get one that looks really nice. To become a better photographer, probably the best thing I did was do a 365 project. I did this last year. I took a photograph every day for a year on a theme. So I couldn't just take my camera and shoot it. There were themes. I joined a group, started by, I thought this guy, his name's Isti Fan. I thought he was an Isti fan. Well, it turns out that's his name. He's German. <laughs> and every week he put out a theme. Here's macro photography. We did a week of landscapes, uh, a picture of famous people. Actually, this was candid shots. People that were photographed, they didn't know they were being photographed. This is at Disney World. This was backlighting, painting with light. I had 26 students in my class, and I thought, wow, that member is kind of significant. So I had every one of them with their cell phone do a letter of the alphabet. It's kind of hard to see, but that was the intent. We did black and white photos. Shadow photography, this is, the, this is the best Kramer I could do. We did a week where we did nothing but motion, a week where we did high dynamic range photography. Now, I'll, I'll end with this. This is something I didn't know about until about a year and a half ago. Uh, I read about it uh, on this website, and it involves a process where you take multiple pictures, starting with a picture that's normally exposed. So you can see in this picture, the sky is kind of bright. The flowers in the foreground are too dark to, to barely see. Then you take another picture where everything is overexposed. So now the, the sky looks entirely white, but you can see those flowers in the front. 
And then the, the third picture is one that's underexposed. So all the buildings, the flowers, everything looked black, but the sky looks really nice. Then you can use software. There's commercial software. There's free software. You put all of those together with the software to make a picture that looks like this. So I take a lot of these kinds of photos because I think they look really neat. And uh, I'll end with that. Mm -hmm.